are her participant and Mr. Pavlo Liutikov as a DHD, DHG Law Professor of Department of Public and Private Law. Yeah, for the topic today is the concept and the essence interpretation of law. Yeah, we will start for this class today, delivered by Mr. Pavlo. For Mr. Pavlo, you can start for this session today. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, dear friends. I would like to <clears throat> continue uh, our uh, previous uh, conversation with you about the interpretation of legal uh, norms. Today, in a continuation of our topic, it is worth to discuss on the rules, principles, and the methods of interpretation. I would like to know that the raised uh, issue is being actively researched uh, by both domestic and foreign legal scholars. But there is, of course, no unity in the opinions of researchers. Last time, you and I mentioned American practicing lawyers and scientists who, based on their experience and centuries-old judicial practice, developed a system of principles, canons, and rules of interpretation, which can be conditionally divided into several large groups. Those American lawyers, uh, Antonin Scalia and Brian Garner, in the monography, reading the law interpretation of legal texts, formulated several dozen principles and canons of legal interpretation. In particular, among the fundamental principles of interpretation, uh, they name the following. Interpretation principle, each application of the text to certain circum circumstances entails an interpretation. Supremacy of text principle, the words of the governing text and what they convey in their context are of primary importance. Principle of interpreting canons. No canon of interpretation is absolute. Any of them can be overcome by the power of another, which has a, which has a different meaning. Presumption against ineffectiveness. Preference should be given to a textually permissible interpretation that contributes to, rather than hides, the purpose of the document. Presumption of validity, the interpretation that confirms the validity of the norm prevails over the, the interpretation that denies it. As for canons of interpretation, I suggest to focus your attention uh, first, at first on semantic canons. Let's start with ordinary meaning canon. Words are to be understood in their ordinary, everyday meanings unless the context indicates that they bear a technical sense. The enlightened patriots who framed our constitution and the people who adopted it must be understood to have employed words in their natural sense and to get and to have intended what they have said. Cited by Chief Justice John Marshall in case Gibbons against Ogden, 1824. The ordinary meaning rule is the most fundamental semantic rule of interpretation. It governs constitution, status, rules, and private instruments uh, that interpreters should to be required to divine arcane, uh, sorry, arcane nuances or to discover hidden meanings. Justice uh, Joseph Story's words are as true today as they were when written in the middle of the 19th century, and they are true not just of constitutions but of all other legal instruments. Every word employed in the Constitution to be expounded in its plain, obvious and common sense, unless the context furnishes some ground to control, qualify or enlarge it. Constitutions are not designed for metaphysical or logical subtleties for niceties of expression, for critical 
property, for elaborate shades of meaning, or for the exercise of philosophical acuteness or judicial research. <clears throat> they are instruments of a practical nature, founded on the common business of human life, adapted to common wants, designed for common use, and fitted for common understanding. <coughs> Sorry. This is not to say that interpretation will always be straightforward and easy, just that we should not make it gratuitously run out and complex. Most common English words have a number of dictionary definitions, some of them quite abstruse and rarely intended. On should assume the contextually appropriate ordinary meaning unless there is a reason to think otherwise. Sometimes there is a reason to think otherwise, which ordinarily comes from context. And it should not be forgotten that not all colloquial meanings appropriate to particular contexts are to be found in the dictionary. Many words have more than one ordinary meaning. The fact is that more common the term, for example, run, the more means it will appear, the more polysemous. It is, linguists put it. Hence, run was once calculated as having more than 800 meanings. Yet, context disambiguates. We can tell the meanings of the is running the, down the hill, she is running late. She has been running the company for four years. The car is running low on gas. His enemies kept running him down. The driver was intent on running him down, and so on. One scholar has suggested that the ordinary meaning rule presumes wrongly that all native listeners and readers of language always understand words to mean the same thing the speakers intended. But those absolutes, all, all and always, mischaracterize the presumption. What the rule presumes is that a truly fluent reader can really by tell in the vast majority of instances from contextual and idiomatic clues which of several possible senses are a word or phrase bears. Consider, a check might be an inspection, an impending of someone else's progress, a roster, a restaurant bill, a commercial instrument, a patent square on a fabric or a distinctive model. A kite might be an object flown in the sky on a stream or how like bird or a predatory person or as a rope to kite might mean to fly, to hurry, or to pass commercial paper prudently. To say something nondescript, such as there was a check or the kite was present, means nothing certain. But once you combine words in ordinary, idiomatic ways, as by referring to check it, to check kitten or by saying he checked the kite carefully before flying it, no ordinary speaking of the speaker of the language could even pretend to misunderstand. Some theories deny that plain, the plain meaning or ordinary meaning ever exist, but common experience proves the contrary. In everyday life, the people to whom rules are addressed continually understand and apply them. Let us consider how the ordinary meaning canon affects legal analysis that occurs in a great variety of contexts. Sometimes the canon governs the interpretation of so simple a word as a preposition. The Pennsylvania Supreme Court had to interpret the meaning of into in a stage that read, a person commits an offense if he knowingly, intentionally or recklessly discharges a firearm, firearm from any location into an occupied structure. One James McCoy was inside the old country buffet when he fired his gun. The question was whether, in ordinary English, into denote the movement from outside to inside, or whether the 
movement of the bullet from the gun chamber into the area in which in first, it first struck something would be sufficient for discharging into an occupied structure. One might have analyzed <coughs> an, uh, <coughs> sorry, one might have inside to other idioms. Run into an occupied structure suggests starting outside and going inside. While peer into an occupied structure suggests a continuing presence outside. On appeal, McCoy was properly held not to have fired his gun into the restaurant since he was already inside, so his conviction was overturned. On a question like that, uh, like that one, a judicial interpreter might attempt simply to rely on his on her or her own sense of the language, or Spragenfuchen, as the Germans calls it. And believe it or not, Spragenfuchel has been a word in our shamelessly pilfering English language since about 1894. But lexicographers and usage commentators have explicitly dealt with questions such as the meaning of intro, and it would be a mistake not to consult them. As the Pennsylvania courts demonstrated, these uh, these uh, authorities can illuminate a question such as the uh, precise context of inter. For us, conven convenience uh, we include as appendix R a list of the principal dictionaries that can be consulted to determine the near contem contemporaneous common meaning of words from 1750 to the present. Cards have sometimes ignored plain meaning in astonishing ways. The Kansas Supreme Court, for example, previously held that roosters are not animals, so that uh, uh, cockfighting was not outlawed by a, a state you making it illegal to subject any animal to cruel mistreatment. Far more satisfactory is the holding of a Massachusetts appellate court that is an animal for proposes of a state prohibiting the award of any life animal as a prize or an award in a game involving, involving skill or chance. The card relied in part in, on dictionary definitions. The word animal, in its common exception, includes Acceptation, sorry, includes all irrational beings. This broad definition, which accords with most dictionary meanings, leaves us a little to contribute by deliberating on where the line should be drawn on any taxonomic, taxonomic scale. Uh, let's listen to the opinion of Professor Stevenson on this matter, who, using the example of one of the cases of judicial practice, expresses his opinion on this matter, which highlights the tension between colloquial meaning or dictionary meaning. Please look at the screen and uh, listen. In just a moment. This is a lecture for my statutory interpretation and regulation class about the Supreme Court case Smith versus United. Just a moment, I want to share the screen. Please, Professor Stevenson lecture. States and from 1993. And here we're talking about whether courts should follow everyday usage or colloquial meaning or um, use dictionary definitions of terms. And as you can probably guess from the pictures I have here, this case involves guns and drugs. And this is a kind of a thing. Another case from the Supreme Court that's about a similar term. Um, and this is the word use and what it means to use a gun. And so we have a federal criminal statute that um, prohibits uh, using guns in drug deals, essentially. And that's what we're talking about here. 
And this case is also in our line of cases about what some of us called the dictionary wars on the Supreme Court, where um, after Justice Scalia was on the court, um, he started referencing uh, dictionary definitions for statutory terms quite a bit. And um, eventually the other justices started citing dictionaries on the other side um, to, our, to answer his dictionaries. And then he would ha say, well, I have three dictionaries. And so then a couple of cases later, they have five dictionaries and he has three, or the, they have the liberals have eight dictionaries and he has five. And then he'll say, but your dictionaries don't count because some of them were published after the enactment of the statute and so forth. So if you're reading this and just, it feels just a little bit ridiculous, um, you're not alone, but keep in mind that somebody's life or, or decades of their life that they might spend in jail are hanging in the balance here. And so let's uh, look at what happens in Smith. So we have a federal statute that imposes criminal penalties on anyone who during and in relation to any crime of violence or drug trafficking crime uses a firearm. That's 18 U.S.C. 924C. This is one of our um, federal gun laws, but it's actually in the context of our drug statutes primarily. Uh, 922 is about the uh, general possession of firearms and sales of firearms. Now, what Smith got, did was his way of using a gun was he traded a MAC-10 automatic firearm, um, which is a depending on uh, which side of the law you're on, either a very desirable weapon of choice for criminals or a pretty scary gun um, the, in exchange for drugs with an undercover officer. This is a, one of the many pictures on the internet of a MAC-10. So, and as you can see, they can be used, you can add a shoulder attachment or you can fire it as sort of a machine gun pistol um, they're bigger than a typical handgun, but um, you, in theory, could have one in each hand. So the majority and the dissenters, of course, disagree on Congress's intended use of uh, intended meaning of the word use um, or use. The majority interpreted the meaning broadly based on the dictionary definition of to employ and the statute structure and the drafter's choice not to use use as a weapon. So they could have modified whoever uses a firearm as a weapon or whoever injures someone with a firearm. And instead, it, the statute just says uses a firearm. And so the question, if you're lost so far, I know, and I, I know some of you are just thinking about your Second Amendment rights and so forth, but this is really about guns and drugs and the a statute that's specifically about not using, we're gonna ratchet up the gradation of the offense if you use a gun or bring a gun to a drug deal. And so, but the problem was that probably most of us think that using a gun means um, either shooting it or brandishing it, right? Pointing it at someone and waving it around, um, or maybe like pistol whipping somebody with it, I guess. Um, but all he did was he, instead of money, he exchanged his very valuable Mac 10 for um, a bunch of cocaine. And so the majority argued that the word, that the use of a firearm as a weapon is only one of several possible uses. And it emphasized that another provision of 924, the same statute, employed the word use in describing offenses that include using a firearm as an item of commerce. And this, both the majority and the dissent do this. And this, by the way, that Interpretive technique that you see laid out and ex explicated in Smith would be really useful to have in your toolbox as a lawyer, your sort of interpretive toolbox, which is to look at the neighboring uh, sections of the act, other sections of 924, or even the statute right before it and right after it, and see um, what they're doing, right, um, with this term or with the same instrumentalities of crime and so forth. And this can carry a lot of weight for courts to argue either that if we interpret this provision this way, it makes another provision um, sort of 
meaningless or surplusage or that cancels it out, or to argue that Congress, when they were passing this sort of body of law about drugs and guns, probably um, using this the same terms the same way, or they don't argue this in the case, the same person or a handful of people were involved in drafting all of these sections. So it's not unreasonable to presume consistency in the use of um, nomenclature. The dissent, we have a, a scathing end of the world as we know it, dissent from Justice Scalia. Um, and uh, he relies heavily on, again, common dictionary definitions. And he urges a narrower interpretation of use based on its ordinary meaning, which is to use as an instrumentality for its intended or distinctive purpose. When, and he says, so basically when you're using something as a gun, you're shooting it or maybe brandishing it to threaten someone with a shooting. So the dissent pointed also to, and by the way, this is another very clever interpretive technique that should be in your sort of lawyer's toolbox. He, Scalia got an older version of the statute, not the current one, where use of a firearm was only in connection with violent crimes. And then at some point, Congress amended it and dropped in, or in a drug deal, as that phrase that we sort of saw at the beginning of this video. And so he's saying that when firearm made its way into this statute, which in its original drafting, um, they were talking about using it as an um, act of violence, not using it as an item of trade, right, of, to barter, basically. Um, and you would never have gotten that until Congress dropped in the phrase, we want this to apply to drug deals, too. The majority countered that it, a subsequent amendment adding drug trafficking crimes to the statute was intended to just expand the coverage of the statute that we uh, Congress had realized there was a public uproar over the amount of gun violence in our country that's actually related to the drug trade. And, and so the, um, so if you've heard the old moniker, guns don't kill people, people kill people. Well, people who are in, who are dealing drugs with guns kill people, right? That's what people in Congress was saying. And so um, they wanted to kind of crack down on the mixing of guns and use of firearms, which really escalated the mortality rate in um, our urban centers surrounding the drug trade. Okay, we're almost done here, actually. The majority applied a broad interpretation based on the dictionary definition of the term use or uses under 924C, and the dissent also made plausible arguments for a narrower kind of everyday interpretation. The dissent is basically saying, fine, the majority is right that that's one of the definitions that's in the dictionary when we looked it up. But in everyday parlance, people say use for the sort of um, platonic function of an item, right? Um, the idealized function. So both sides employed historical and structural modalities of interpretation. Here's a couple of thought questions to end with. How does the court ascertain plain or clear meaning of the text and the law, right? So Justice Scalia is always saying we should just apply the plain meaning, but how do we decide what the plain meaning is if we can't even get nine justices on the Supreme Court who all have legal training and so forth to agree on what the word use means in a single sentence? How clear is the meaning? And then that leads us to our second question. Can a statute be clear? The justices disagree about its meaning. And at one point, there are other cases where the justices say um, in some of those statutes about ambiguity, the very fact that we have a dissenting opinion here shows that there's ambiguity in the statute, right? So if, if the nine of us around a conference table can't agree on what the word means, then it's ambiguous. Um, and then, as you know, Ambiguity, once we, if we decide that the term is inherently ambiguous, that can trigger other legal rules. In the criminal context, it can trigger the rule of lenity, which favors a defendant. In the administrative law context, ambiguity in the statute can trigger Chevron deference, where the agency kind of gets um, a little 
uh, thumb on the scale uh, in their favor. Um, also ask yourself, what resources can the court consider to break a deadlock on statutory interpretation? Should, be, should we get into things? Um, should they be uh, shopping around other sections of the statute? Um, is that better than looking at legislative history and so forth? There's no right answer to these questions, but there are questions that keep coming up and that someday you may be having to argue one side of in a case when you're a lawyer. Okay, back to um. Uh, thank you. Uh, sometimes context indicate that a uh, technical meaning applies. Every field of service and develops its own nomenclature. Uh, sometimes, uh, to as terms of art, uh, some, sometimes referred to as uh, terms of art, where the uh, text is addressing a scientific or, or technical subject or specialized meaning is to be expected. In terms of art, which are above the comprehension of the general bulk uh, of mankind, records for explanation must be had to those who are most experienced in the art. And when the law is the subject, ordinary legal meaning is to be expected, which often differs from common meaning. As Justice uh, Frank Hutter eloquently expressed it, if a word is obviously transplanted from another legal source, whether the common law or other legislation, it brings the old soil with it. Perhaps the most famous example of the technical meaning exception, one uh, that parades legal drafting, is the presumption that person in legal instruments denotes a corporation and other entity, not just a human being. This presumption has been known to rankle non-lawyers when they encounter it. A case uh, exemplifying ordinary legal meaning that diverges from everyday usage is said against Gonzalez, which involved a Louisiana state defining the crime of contributing to the delinquency of a juvenile and the <clears throat> intentional Anything, hiding, soliciting, or permitting by anyone over the age of 17, of any child under the age of 17, to perform any sexually immoral act. Ernest Gonzalez, an adult, was convicted of this crime after enticing a 16 years old to have sex with him. Yet she had already been emancipated and twice married. Was she a child under the age of 70? No, according to the Louisiana Supreme Court. The word child does not include an emancipated meaning in the ordinary accepted meaning under civil law. Another technical meaning case involved the word consideration, which in general English means something to be taken account of of or valid thoughtfulness, but in law means value given in exchange for a benefit. Now consider a statute that makes a felon of however for a consideration knowingly gives fails information to any officer of any card with intent to influence the officer in the performance of official function. A criminal defendant, defendant seeking reduced bail lies to a trial court, saying that he has never before been convicted of a crime, as a result of which he gets his bail reduced. Has he lied for a consideration? A non lawyer and schooled in the ways of legal terminology might well say so. But from the legal point of view, did he lie in exchange for something of value? The prosecution said that he did. The reduction in bail that he received as a consequence of his failed statement was valuable to him. The defense lawyers argued that the phrase uh, of a consideration means for an agreed exchange 
and in the context of the state envisions some benefit received from a third party in exchange for failed testimony. They asked that there was no agreed exchange, no legal consideration, when pliancy is merely the consequence of the failed testimony. And they were right, as the Wisconsin Court of Appeals held. If the card had not applied the specialized legal sense of consideration, it would have miscon misconstrued the state. Cards as well as advocates have been known to overlook technical sense of ordinary words, senses that might uh, be directly on their decisions. Consider uh, a step against state decided in 1995 by the Tex uh, Tex uh, Texas Court of Criminal Appeals. Uh, the issue was the meaning of a procedural rule that provided. An appeal shall be dismissed on the state's motion supported by affidavit showing that appellant has escaped from custody pending the appeal and that, to the affiant's knowledge, has not voluntarily returned to lawful custody within the state within 10 days after escaping. Having been uh, convicted of telephone harassment, Jeffrey Estep appealed. Twelve days later, the state filed a motion to dismiss Estep's appeal, together with an affidavit from a prosecutor stating that a step was taken into custody and then mistake, mistakenly realized by the Dallas County Sheriff's Department. On the same day, he filed a notice of appeal. According to the affidavit, he had not voluntarily returned to lawful custody within Texas within 10 days of uh, leaving the Dallas County Sheriff's Department. Had he escaped? Finding that he had the trial, guards granted the motion. On appeal, the crucial question was the meaning of the word escape. The prosecutors argued that if a convicted criminal is accidentally realized, even by the intentional action of a person with authority to realize him, he is considered to have escaped. The Court of Appeals disagreed. For its understanding of the term, term escape, the card relied on an abrogated, outdated, non scholarly dictionary. The 1980 edition of the Oxford American Dictionary, which defined escape as to get oneself free from conf confinement or control. The card decided not to expand the concept of escape to include realizes authorized realizes authorized by persons in authority but not authorized by law what the card overlooked perhaps because it failed to consult a law dictionary in that escape as term of art has traditionally borne precisely the meaning that the card disclaimed to include a realize authorized authorized by a jailer but without legal sanction Consider one thing dictionaries have consistently defined escapes in the mid 19th century. 1839. An escape is the deliverance of a person out of prison who is lawfully imprisoned before such person is entitled to such deliverance by law. Another one. 1847. The escaping or getting out of lawful restraint as when a man has been arrested or imprisoned and gets away before he is discharged by due course of law. An escape is either negligent or voluntary, negligent where the party escapes without the consent of the sheriff or his officer, voluntary where the sheriff or his officer permits him to go at large. 1969. A criminal offense at common law and by state in most jurisdictions consisting in the unlawful departure of a legally confined 
prisoner from custody or the act of prisoner in regaining his liberty before being realized in due course of law. The criminal offense committed by a jailer, warden or other custodian of a prisoner in permitting him to depart from custody unlawfully. 20.09. At the common law, a criminal offense committed by a peace officer who allows a prisoner to depart unlawfully from legal custody. This term of art sense, admittedly on the vein in legal usage, should have been considered in determine, determining which stand the word bore in the rule. The court's decision may well have been correct, but not because escape could not possibly mean <clears throat> a realize in which the prisoner was a passive participant. Not always it is easy to determine whether ordinary meaning or specialized meaning applies. For example, in case Nix against Haddon, the Supreme Court of the United States was presented with the question whether tomatoes were subject to the import tariff applicable to fruit or to the higher tariff applicable to vegetables. Also, botanists classify the tomato as a fruit the American people consider it is a vegetable. In a brief, straightforward opinion, the card sided with ordinary meaning, not exactly a victory for the ordinary person, who as a result had to pay more for tomatoes. The decision was not clearly correct. Then the card had long applied a rule that ambiguities in tariff and tax status are not to be construed in favor of the taxpayer. Another canon, Gende number canon. In the absence of a contrary indication, the masculine includes the feminine and vice versa, and the singular includes the plural and vice versa. In the constitution, the president is referred to many times with the pronouns he, him, and his. These reference, references by common grammatical understanding refer to a president of either sex. Grammarians and lexicographers have traditionally held that masculine includes a feminine. He, him, and his are considered third person singular common sex pronouns. But only when the context calls for this understanding <clears throat> and also. English language texts are revived with the generic masculine pronoun. In the recent decades, there has been a concerted effort among writers and editors, particularly in academic, particular in academic legal writing, to eradicate this convention, but it persists. Does the principle that the masculine includes the feminine include the reverse? Does the new politically correct generic feminine pronoun every judge who recuses herself is subject to his rule include the masculine? Yes, at least in text adopted in the age of political correctness. As for singular plural principle, the United States Court addressed this issue as well as the previous one in its rules of construction. In determining the meaning of any act of Congress, unless the context indicates otherwise, words important that singular include and apply to several persons, parties, or scenes. Words important that plural include the singular. Words important that masculine gender include the feminine as well. The rule is simply a matter of common sense and everyday linguistic experience. It is a misdemeanor for any person to set off a rocket within the city limits without a writing license from the fire marshal. Does not exempt from penalty someone who sets off two rockets or a string of 100. If you cannot do one, you cannot do any or many. The best drafting practice, in fact, is to use the singular number for just, the reason, for just that reason. Each rocket unambiguously constitutes an offense. But what if the drafter makes the reference plural? 
that would normally include the singular. A provision in lease saying that no person may set off rockets on the premises would properly be interpreted to forbid the setting off of a single rocket. But the proposition uh, that many includes only one is not as logically inevitable as a proposition that one includes multiplies ones. So its application is much more subject to context and contradiction by other comments. If the same plural rockets were used in a governmental prescription carrying a penalty, it is a misdemeanor for any person to set off rockets within the city limits. And as there is some chance that Cartes would apply the rule of lenity to hold a single rocket harmless. As instance discussed by both Blackstone and Bentham considered at 1278 state establishing the penalty for stealing horses. The English judges held that uh, this provision did not apply to someone who stole a single horse. Bentham defended the holding as praiseworthy. This construction, I am aware, has been cited as an instance of scrupulousness carried to the extreme. But I must confess, I see not with what justice. Taking the value of the sin stolen for the measure of the guilt of stealing, the guilt of stealing horses is a is at least double. To that of stealing one's horse, and it follows not that because the legislature legislator has sought fit to annex a certain degree of punishment to a certain degree of guilt, and therefore should annex the same to how that guilt. In the doubt, in that doubt, the safest decision was uh, that which was on the mildest side, and from this no evil consequence could arise when followed by the well-imagined imagined step that was taken next by the judges. They procured a new act, says Blackstone, in the following year. In, a, our, in our, those judges and are of uh, all I know up on record would cherish this precedent they have set us. It points to their successors. The true method of giving the public the benefit of the discerned without transgressing the limits of their authority. His point is well taken, which is why books on legal drafting recommended using the singular over the plural. I would like to focus uh, special attention on the canon of rule of lenity, which I mentioned a few minutes ago. I would like to introduce you to a an interesting case from judicial practice that clearly demonstrate <coughs> sorry this rule of interpretation. Please listen. <coughs> sorry. Um, often called leg reg or legislation and regulation. And we're going to be talking about the rule of lenity. This is a classic canon of construction. Um, that's really about construing penal statutes or the criminal code uh, in favor of defendants or giving defendants the benefit of the doubt when there's ambiguity in the statute. And by the way, um, you're gonna see references throughout this to something called Sutherland's statutory construction. A couple uh, quick words about this. First, Sutherland's is the sort of premier uh, um, multi-volume treatise about statutory interpretation and construction. So when you're in practice, if you need uh, uh, the most authoritative secondary source you can find besides case law um, uh, to cite in a brief, you should use Sutherland. It's, it's, it's sort of like the highest word on statutory interpretation. The other thing that's nice is about Sutherland is that it's um, a database on Westlaw and is searchable and is annotated. And so if you have a case come up that's about something like the rule of lenity, Sutherland's will, um, annotated, will point you to a lot of other cases and save you a lot of time 
in finding other cases about this, um, at least older cases, uh, on different aspects and applications of the rule of lenity. Okay, last word about this. The rule of lenity is part of a group of things we call canons of construction. And we're not talking about construction like putting up buildings, we're talking about construction in the sense of construing a statute um, and when judges have to interpret a statute. The casebook that I used divides these sort of classic canons of construction into semantic canons, which are really about how words relate to each other in a sentence and uh, um, or in a body of text. Some of them feel like grammatical rules almost. And, um, and then substantive canons, which are really sort of policy decisions from the courts about that really reflect an understanding of the judiciary's role um, vis-a-vis the legislature and the executive branch and, and so forth. And in some ways, some people wouldn't even call them canons, um, substantive canons, they would just say it's just a maxim or a rule. You should also be aware, and I say this to my students many times, there's a long tradition starting in uh, with a very influential long, law review article um, in 1950 that is of academic skepticism about the canons of construction and people saying that they're all a hoax or meaningless or things like that. Um, I hold the contrary view, which is that statutes are their own sort of genre of writing, written text or literature that has um, distinct structural features and compositional features. And a lot of our canons are really to recognize that or ways to identify these sort of um, building blocks of statutes that happen again and again and what we do with those. So this is a very sort of structural idea or a way of thinking that there's sort of this um, archetype template <clears throat> for statutes and the canons are it almost help uh, name these different like building blocks that we have that we combine and recombine when we draft and enact statutes. Okay, so let's talk just about the rule of lenity for a moment. Um, here's a, I'm gonna have a few quotes from uh, Sutherland about it, and then some of my own comments for you. Traditionally, courts have construed penal statutes, and again, we're talking about criminal statutes where you can go to jail, um, strictly in a defendant's favor. Uh, two centuries ago, the Supreme Court, John Marshall observed the rule the penal laws are to be construed strictly is perhaps not much less old than construction itself. In other words, this is one of our oldest canons. Um, it has a very impressive historical pedigree uh, going back to um, the 16 um, and 1700s. If you wanted a nice classic like statement of the rule of lenity, that's one from a pretty official source. Now, here's a few sort of nuances or caveats. The rule of lenity applies only if, after using the usual tools of statutory construction, courts are left with a grievous ambiguity or uncertainty in a statute. In other words, if the statute's clear, there's no rule of lenity to come into play. It doesn't trigger the rule of lenity. The rule of lenity is about ambiguous criminal statutes, or maybe, maybe, where a statute is silent on some point that has come up in, in a criminal prosecution. And the idea is when there's statutory silence or ambiguity or vagueness, that we should resolve that in the favor, lean a little bit in the defendant's favor, sort of tilt the table, um, so to speak. But remember, if the statute's really clear, it doesn't matter, um, uh, the rule of lenity doesn't matter at all and doesn't come into play. Okay, uh, here's another quote. If a law, and I have the sites uh, there in fine print, if you need to jot it down, you can pause the video. If a law has both criminal and civil applications, the rule of lenity governs its interpretation in both settings. And the more severe an act's possible penalty, the stricter the construction may be. In other words, if we're going to interpret the statute more narrowly, the more severe the punishment is. And so courts often construe a felony statute more strictly than a misdemeanor statute. Okay, we're not gonna go too much longer, I promise. 
The rule of lenity applies to the substantive ambit of criminal prohibitions, as well as the, to the penalties they impose, including sentencing guidelines. And this is an interesting point that we don't often cover in our statutory interpretation classes and cases, is that we also, remember, have codified like sentencing guidelines now. And so we have to, judges end up having to interpret the sentence sections and, or punishment sections of either statutes or sentencing guidelines, and the rule of lenity can come into play there as well. And in practical terms, when it applies, defendants are less likely to be guilty or liable, and courts are um, uh, will choose the less severe penalty, even if the conviction is sort of in the bag. For example, remember that in the vast majority of criminal prosecutions in the United States, the defendants enter a guilty plea, right? We resolve the cases through plea bargaining in the, probably more than 90% of the cases. So an awful lot of what judges are doing in on the criminal docket is really sentencing. Application of the rule depends as an initial matter on a judicial finding of ambiguity. And this is sort of um, uh, extending a point from above. A statute is ambiguous if it can reasonably be interpreted in two or more ways. But it's not ambiguous simply because different interpretations are conceivable. A statute is not ambiguous for lenity purposes um, just because judicial authority is divided over its proper construction. Okay, um, where do we get this rule of lenity? Courts often base it on ideas of due process. The idea that unclear statutes are also unfair to the citizenry. And, and so, for example, someone doesn't who wants to obey the law doesn't really know how to conform their behavior to the requirements of the law. Um, and all of a sudden they're being prosecuted and caught by surprise. And that idea is supposed to kind of horrifying to the judiciary. Uh, keep in mind that ignorance of the law is no excuse, but the idea is we don't really want to have these open-ended big um, rules that are then construed against criminal defendants. You could, in that sense, you could think of this as a step down from holding the statute void for vagueness. If it's not so vague that we have to invalidate the statute on constitutional grounds, and by the way, void for vagueness is always done on due process grounds. Um, then maybe we can construe the ambiguity, we'll save the statute, but construe it a little bit in the direction of favoring the defendant. Others may treat this as sort of leveling the playing field a little bit between the fearsome power of the executive branch of the government. Remember that the prosecutors are sort of the sharp end of the stick um, for our democratic government. And then you have these sort of helpless individual defendants. And if you have a judge that sees a lot of cases as these sort of David versus Goliath battles between the lone individual citizen um, and the, the scary big um, government with almost infinite resources, they may talk about the rule of lenity as sort of trying to help the little guy, so to speak, or intervene where um, it's not a level playing field or a fair fight at all. Thank you. Perfect. Yeah. Let's listen about another canon, negative implication canon. The expression of one thing implies the exclusion of others. Expressio unius est exclusio alterius. Expressio unius, also known as inclusio unius, is a Latin name for the communicative device known as negative implication. In English, it is known as the negative implication canon. We encounter the device and recognize it frequently in our daily lives. <clears throat> when a car dealer promises a low fin financial rate to Purchases with good credit, it is entirely clear that the rate is not available to purchases with spotted credit. Virtually all the authorities who discuss the negative implication can emphasize that it must be applied with great caution, since its application depends so much on context. Indeed, 
One commentator suggests that it is a, not a proper canon at all, but merely a description of the result planned from context. That goes too far. Context establishes the conditions for applying the canon, but where those conditions exist, the principle that specification of the one implies exclusion of the other validity is describes how people express themselves and understand verbal expression. The doctrine properly applies only when the unions can reasonably be thought to be an expression <coughs> sorry, of all that shares in the grounds of prohibition involved. Common sense often suggests when this is or is not so. The sign outside a restaurant, no dogs allowed, cannot be sought to mean that no other creatures are excluded. As if pet monkeys, pot-billed pigs and baby elephants, baby elephants might be quite welcome. Dogs are specifically addressed because they are the animals that customers are most likely to bring in. Nothing is implied about other animals. On the other hand, the sign outside a veterinary clinic saying, open for treatment of dogs, cats, horses, and all other farm or domestic animals, does suggest by its detail that the circus lion with a health problem is out of luck. The more specific the enumeration, the greater the force of the canon. If Parliament in legislating speaks only of a specific sins and specific situation, it is a legitimate inference that the particulars ex exhaust the legislative will. The particular which is omitted from the particulars mentioned in the causes omissions. That would amount to legislation. Even when an all-inclusive sense seems apparent, one must still identify the scope of the inclusiveness, thereby limiting an implied exclusion. Consider the sign at the entrance to a beachfront restaurant. No shoes, no shirt, no service. By listing something that will cause a denial of service, the sign implied that other scenes will not. One can be confident about not being excluded on grounds or not wearing socks, for example, or of not wearing a jacket and tie. But what about coming in without pants? What is not included in the negative implication because the specified def uh, deficiency in attire noted by the sign and obviously do that are common at the beach? <clears throat> As the common at the beach, no socks, no jacket, no light, will implicitly not result in denial of service. But there is no reasonable implication regarding wardrobe absence not common at the beach. They go beyond the category to which the negative implication pertains. This interpretative canon should not be confused with other principles of law that may produce identical results. One commentator ascribes to the canon the Supreme Court's doctrine that private rights of action are not to be implied in federal status that don't expressly create them, and thus and goes uh, on to condemn both the canon and the doctrine. But while some cases applying the presumption against implied right of action mention the fact that the state in question contains an express private right of action separate from the implied one asset. The provision of an express right is not considered the basis for a condition of the doctrine. Indeed, the presumption against implied right of action has been invoked in several cases in which there was no basis for applying the negative application canon. And perhaps the most consequential implying of a private right of action, one of violating paragraph 10b of the Securities Exchange Act, occurred with a respect to a state here. They did create express private rights 
of action for other violations, so that the negative application canon would have precluded the implied right of action. But the United States Supreme Court's rejection of implied rights of action is based not on a negative implication from an expressed private right of action, but instead on the principle that federal courts don't possess the lawmaking power of common law courts. If Congress does not create a private right of action for violating one of its laws, the courts have no power to create one. However, in this context, it should be mentioned that the court actually exercises control of legislative activity, including when, uh, when considering a dispute, it establishes the true meaning of the norm and, in fact, in some way creates a new norm. Let's listen to the opinion of Professor Stevenson on this matter, who argues that the role of the court is, among other things, to keep the legislator in order and protect the person from the uh, omnipotence of any government body. Interpretation and regulation administrative agencies. And we're really talking here about some kind of big picture interpretive issues for courts and the role that courts have or the judicial role in interpreting statutes. And a lot of this centers around different philosophies about the judiciary and the relationship between the courts and the um, legislature. And so here, I'm going to present three kind of competing views. Now, people, courts don't always settle on one and stick with it. They sometimes alternate, sometimes within one opinion. Um, but the case books for different classes, to some extent in administrative law and definitely in the statutory interpretation and regulation or legislation and regulation case books, um, will talk about these different sort of schools of thought of the relationship of the courts to the legislature and how deferential um, they'll be. And so this is very introductory. This is something you should watch probably at the beginning of the course and keep in mind as you're reading the cases as we go along through the course material. So let's take a look. We have three sort of competing schools of thought or viewpoints to talk about. Number one is what we call the faithful agent. And this is the idea that a court should be a faithful agent of the legislature, or courts should be faithful agents of the legislature. In other words, it's the legislature's job to make the laws. It's the most democratic branch. And so the court is supposed to try to search for and then defer to the intent or purpose of the legislature in passing the statute. So when a court has to interpret a law, under the faithful agent view, its job is to carry out the will of the legislature, to implement um, what Congress thought it was doing when it passed that statute or that enactment. And instead of being contrary or thwarting the will of Congress, um, courts should be faithfully carrying out and fulfilling the legislative goals of Congress. Um, this faithful agent view is really based, I think, on a majoritarian idea, right? Because the, it's going to be the majority that wins Congress or wins control of Congress. And so the idea is that Congress or the legislature represents a majority of the citizens and they get, we live in a country, a democracy of self-governance, and that is done through elected representatives. So if we're going to govern ourselves, then we do it through our elected representatives, and that's the state legislature or Congress that enacts the laws on our behalf, on behalf of the majority. And so the court is um, being true to that, but you have to have some belief in majoritarian rule to really buy into the faithful agent view. Now, a contrasting view is what I call the counter-majoritarian view, and this is the idea that the court's not here to just um, carry water for the legislature or rubber stamp what the legislature wants. The court instead is there to sort of protect vulnerable groups against the tyranny and oppression of majority rule in society. 
In other words, the poor, racial or ethnic or religious or linguistic minorities in society and um, uh, people who are have unpopular political views or lifestyles and, and so forth. And it, the problem is that majorities will tend to either ignore them or oppress and exploit them. And courts are there to sort of make sure that's not happening. In other words, th this view, a counter-majoritarian view, sort of treats statutes with suspicion rather than deference, recognizing that democracy is majority equals majority rule, and that at least the lesson of history is that majorities like to oppress minority groups or individuals who really don't have as much of a voice in a democracy because they're underrepresented or because they're disadvantaged or live in poverty or have a language barrier or something or face other types of systemic discrimination. And so this view assumes that the role of the judiciary in relation to the legislature is at least partly to keep the legislature in check and serves as and sort of serve as protectors of the powerless. So if, again, if you believe that the will of the people should rule, you're more likely to sort of go along with the faithful agent view. And if you really believe in checks and balances, that the, the three branches of government are there to sort of um, rein in the others and sort of block them from taking things too far, then that's a more counter-majoritarian view. And so, it's to, and so here, actually, sometimes it is the court's job to thwart the will of the legislature because the legislature is oppressing or exploiting or in other ways disempowering um, at vulnerable groups and disadvantaged groups in our democracy. There's a I use doesn't talk about it all that I call the anti-faction view, and this is the idea that courts should read statutes being wary of the capacity of special interest groups to hijack the legislative process through lobbying and dark money and things like that. If, if you were a big fan of the Federalist Papers, the Founding Fathers were very concerned about factions. In fact, they thought that factions arguably were the downfall of democracy or the big weakness of democracy. And that's exact, that is why we needed checks and balances. So not, it was not to protect against the tyranny of the majority, but to protect against special interest groups. So this view sort of assumes that the problem with democracies is that most citizens are disengaged politically, at least most of the time, focused on other things, right? So they're not thinking about the, the process that we should have for approving vaccines or whether the government should fund the development of vaccines and distribute them or if it should just subsidize private companies that do it or if it should just leave vaccines to the free market. These are sort of big picture issues. How do we regulate financial markets? and currency values and higher education? How do we give accreditation to institutions of higher accreditation? And most people are honestly really just focused on making a living and surviving and taking care of their families and looking forward to the next holiday and so forth. And they're not, they're not really thinking about these things. And the, uh, the downside of that is that a well-organized, highly motivated faction or special interest group, or maybe even a lone billionaire can um, take over, right, can start to become the puppet master pulling the strings behind the scenes. And so that's a concern. And if you buy into that idea, then you might assume that a lot of the stuff that comes out of the legislature is really um, there to serve the interests of one special interest group and at the expense of everyone else. So judges with this view approach statutes with skepticism presuming that legislation off, often serves the interest of some small special interest group, maybe with a lot of money or influence or power that is really organized politically at the expense of the majority and maybe of, at the expense of my, other minority groups too, or everyone else. And so you don't have to pick one of these views at the beginning of our class or even at the end of the semester, but some students already kind of
students uh, really like the majoritarian view and believe and hate a judicial activism and want to see judges basically just fulfill the will of the legislature. Others believe that courts are there to stop Congress from um, uh, from going off the deep end and the executive branch from uh, from seizing power and being tyrannical. And others are actually really worried about special interest groups and are hoping that judges are immune from that because they're apolitical. And so whichever view you lean towards, it will be useful for you to the, in the course to be able to at least to empathize with other viewpoints so that you can follow the interpretive intuitions that run through the cases we study. Because a lot of the judges have, when they are writing a case, are sort of working within one of these three frameworks. And the type of logic that flows from that becomes very intuitive for how we interpret statutes and how we, how much weight we give to the um, what the parties are asking for or what the government is doing, um, asking us their interpretation or what we think was going on at the legislature when they passed the bill. Also, please note that these different sort of schools of thought or philosophies about how literally to take statutes, the textualists, the intentionalists, and the purposivists, which we will talk about in some more depth in my class, all claim that their view is actually the best way to fulfill what the legislature wanted. They're not, none of them are really saying that they're with the second or third view trying to thwart um, the legislature or keep it in check. They generally see the courts uh, adopt textualism because they think that they it fits with the a faithful application of the statutes, or the intentionalists think that they're they're really investing to find the intent of the legislature. The per, ones focused on purpose are really focusing on what the legislature overall was trying to achieve or the purpose of enactment. That concludes. Let's continue our conversation. Thank you for your attention. I'll give you a few examples. Um, in one case, the state constitution declared that the judges of uh, super records <coughs> sorry, uh, must be elected by both branches of the legislature. Uh, then uh, uh, later, a legislative act authorized that the governor to appoint a temporary super record judge. The card applied the negative implication canon to the constitutional language. If one having authority prescribes the mode in which a particular act, the naming of judges, is to be done, can the agent, the legislator, who executes it substitute any other? Does not the act of prescribing the mode necessarily imply a prohibition to all other modes? Hence, the stage was held unconstitutional. A second case illustrates what uh, can happen when a court seems not even to recognize that the doctrine applies. A Mississippi stage provided that assistant district attorneys may be removed uh, at the discretion of the duly elected and acting district attorney. Also, district attorney was an elected position some district attorneys were appointed by the governor between elections. And so the question arose uh, whether a gubernatorial appointee had the power to remove assistant district attorneys. Did he have uh, that power even to uh, he had not been? The negative implication cannot, would suggest not. Yet the Mississippi Supreme Court, uh, without even mentioning, much less considering the canon, held that appointed district attorneys who had not been duly elected were improved to by assistant district attorneys. It uh, likewise did not mention or consider another canon that had obvious application, the uh, surplusage canon. Its interpretation to prove the words duly elected and or uh, of all effect. A third case ex exemplifies a correct result, even though the card did not specify the site of doctrine. A New Hampshire state 
immunized uh, municipalities from damages arising from uh, insufficient uh, hazards in pub on public highways, bridges or sidewalks. When, when such hazards are caused, other emplacement was a person who suffered damages from a fall on uh, ice in a public parking lot through the city of Laconia. The city claimed a statutory immunity, arguing that first, the parking lots uh, are essential components of their highway system. Second, the purpose of the state was to protect cities from lawsuits resulting from weather conditions on public property, and they saw the legislator could not be expected to enumerate in the state every single type of public property. The plaintiff argued that a parking lot is not a highway, not a bridge, and not a sidewalk, and that the immunity, therefore, did not apply. The legislator could easily have written any public property, including highways, bridges, and sidewalks, but it did now. The New Hampshire Supreme Court correctly held that because the law specified three types of public property, but omitted all the immunity did not the lawsuit. As uh, the New Hampshire case illustrates, uh, the negative implication canon is so intuitive intuitive uh, that cards often apply it correctly without calling it by name. Consider United States against Giordano, decided by the Supreme Court of the United States in 1974. A statute established procedures for obtaining card orders uh, authoring uh, the in, in, inter <clears throat> sorry, interception of wire and oral communication. It said that the attorney general or any assistant attorney general special designed by the attorney general could authorize application for such orders. In Giordano's case, it was the attorney general's executive assistant who applied for the card authorized writer. Hence, Giordano argued that the conversations to be used as evidence had been unlawfully intercept and should be suppressed. And unanimous court agreed with him. The state to name two types of high-ranking officials and all other were excluded. Another one canon is the general terms canon. Uh, general terms uh, are not to be given their general meaning. Without some indication to the contrary, general words, like all words, general or not, are to be accorded their full and fair scope. They are not to be arbitrarily limited. This is a general terms canon which is based on the reality that it is possible and useful to formulate categories. For example, dangerous weapons, without knowing all the items that may fit or may later once invented, come to fit within those categories. Some think uh, that when cards uh, controlled generally, confront generally worded provisions, they should infer exceptions for situations that the drafters never contemplated uh, and didn't intend their general language to resolve. And these people want uh, card cards to approach general words differently from how they approach words that are narrow and specific. Traditional principles of interpretation reject this distinction because the presumed point of using general words is to produce general coverage. Recognize ad hoc exceptions. It is true that literal meaning is more readily discernible when the provisions are concrete and specific than when they are abstract and general. And one is right to hesitate and ponder before deciding that a specific factual situation falls within the coverage of a general provision. But in the end, general words and general words, and they must be given general effect. 
Examples of general rules with general meanings can be found in the post-Civil War amendments in the United States Constitution. The 14th Amendment, for example, guarantees equal protection of the laws to all persons. Some commentators have argued that because it was enabled for the benefit of blacks, it should not apply to anybody else. But it, uh, in the first case, to expand the 15th and 15th Amendments, the slaughterhouse cases, the Supreme Court acknowledged the bread the breadth of the language used as contrasted with the immediate purpose of their passage. We don't say that no one else but the Negro can share in this protection of the 13, 14, and 15 amendments. Both the language and spirit of uh, the, these articles are to have their fair and just weight uh, in any question of construction. Undoubtedly, while Negro slavery alone was in the mind of the Congress, which proposed the 13th article, it forbids any other kind of slavery, now or hereafter. If Mexican peonage of the Chinese school labor system shall develop slavery of the Mexican or Chinese race within our territory, this amendment may safely be trusted to make it a void. And uh, so, if other rights are assigned by the states, which properly and necessarily fall within the protection of these articles, that protection will apply to the party interested may not be of African descent. Both text and tradition support this much of the opinion. The language of the 14th Amendment that no state may deny to any person to equal protection of the law is very general. Scholarly commentary has long agreed. In 1922, a respected commentator accurately stated, although the primary purpose of the 14th Amendment was undoubtedly to safeguard the Negro in his new status of a free man, its actual scope is vastly wider than that and its effect has been very far reaching. Nor could the general wording of the 14th Amendment be confined to men, and it never has been. One of the arguments sometimes trotted out to show that textualists are not really even-handed in the argument that despite the 14th Amendment's guarantee of equal protection to all persons, women, we were not given the vote until adoption of the 19th Amendment. That has nothing to do with the meaning of person in the 14th Amendment. It has to do with the meaning of equal protection. Not all instances of treating people differently violate the guarantee, which is why on adoption of the 14th Amendment, unisex toilets did not appear in all public buildings. And as horrible as it may seem, there is no doubt that the society that adopted the 14th Amendment did not believe that the equal protection guarantee gave women the vote as the uh, era uh, at the laws of the era demonstrate. The general terms uh, cannot apply to interpretive issues with great frequency. In an Eighth Circuit case, the court construed a federal statute allowing the government to seize any property, including money, that had been used for an illegal gambling business. The question arose uh, whether any property, including money, included real as well as personal property. The government had begun uh, for future actions against 13 parcels of real estate that had allegedly been used in a legal gambling business. The trial court interpreted the term property not to include real property and therefore dismissed the forfeiture actions. But the appellate court quite rightly held that any property means any property, real and personal.
It is not limited by the phrase including mine. And ill considered descent would have helped that the clear language means something other than what it said, based in part of legislative history and on the spirit of the law. It should be understood that American judicial practice on the spirit of the law has a long history, which speaks not only uh, of the flexibility of representatives in a given case, but it also evidence of the democratic foundation of the American state, where human interests come first. Let's listen to the opinion of Professor Stevenson, who, however, draws attention to the possible negative manifestations of using this uh, principle. I'm Drew Stevenson, and this is a lecture for my statutory interpretation and regulation class about the classic case Riggs v. Palmer. This is a New York Court of Appeals case from 1889 about the letter of the law and the spirit of the law. Now, for my students, um, this is a famous case with legal philosophers or people that write about jurisprudence or the connection of morality uh, to courts and statutes because it this is about a murder and someone who murders his um, grandfather so that he can inherit the money. And then what is the court supposed to do? Um, is should they give the inheritance to the person who killed his, um, his relative just to inherit? For purposes of our class, I want to focus on the statutory interpretation approaches uh, taken by the majority and the dissent in the case. But you should be aware, if you search for other YouTube videos about this, there's some really good ones um, discussing this from sort of a moral philosophy uh, or jurisprudence or philosophy of law standpoint. But here we're learning about how to interpret statutes. So let's look at what happens in this case. So Elmer Palmer is our bad guy in the case, and he's a young man who lives with his grandfather, Francis, and grandfather Francis, that's Francis Palmer, left the bulk of his estate to Elmer. Elmer was worried that Francis would reconsider, was, going, was actually preparing to write him out of the will, so Elmer poisoned him and so that he could inherit and with the will intact that favored him. Elmer was caught and was convicted of murder and was presumably sitting in a jail cell at the time of this case, but he still wanted to inherit the money and um, for whatever reason. I'm not sure what, how much good it would have done him in prison, but that's beside the point. Now, the victim, the, the grandfather, Francis Palmer, had two daughters, and we're not sure why they were kind of getting written out of the will, um, or not left that much, but there's Loretta, Loretta Palmer Riggs, who's pictured here with her husband, and her sister, Mrs. Press, who the court only calls Mrs. Preston. Loretta Palmer Riggs is the Riggs in the name of the case, Riggs v. Palmer, and Palmer is um, Elmer, the murderer. So the daughters sue, claiming that Elmer shouldn't inherit because he should not profit from his own crimes or wrongdoing. Now, the statutes at the time, and these are the old New York statutes, um, provided with no exceptions for inheritance pursuant to a duly executed will. So if the will was properly executed, the courts had to honor the wishes of the testator. The question presented in the case was whether Elmer could inherit under um, the will's statute, despite the fact that he would thereby, or thereby profit from his crime. And remember, the statute didn't have like an exception built into it, like it, it's at least it didn't articulate an exception for this type of case for people that kill the testator um, in order to inherit or um, for the equities of the situation or anything like that. So the New York Court of Appeals applied what it called rational interpretation, noting that writers of laws do not always express their intentions perfectly but either exceed it or fall short of it so that judges are to collect it from probable or rational conjectures only. 
By the way, there is a sort of a, a deep question here about philosophy of language and the view that language and especially written language like a statute is always simultaneously a little bit over-inclusive and a little bit under-inclusive. We do our best to communicate. We may communicate effectively, but we don't communicate perfectly. There's always, we're, we're always a little overstating and a little understating in our written documents. That's the theory anyways. But the court here is actually more focused on just doing the right thing. So applying that principle, the court then remarked, what could be more unreasonable than to suppose that it was the legislative intention in the general laws passed for the orderly, peaceable, and just devolution of property that they should have operation in favor of one who murdered his ancestor, that he might speedily come into the possession of his estate. Such an intention is inconceivable, right? That's what the court is saying. And so note here, what they're saying is there is no way the legislature wanted this. So imagine that if we had a process in our system, and we don't, where courts could certify a question to the legislature the way lower courts certify questions to the high court or courts of a, a, a federal court certify a question to the state Supreme Court about what is the, the current state law or something like that. We don't really have a way for the court to just certify a question to the legislature. But the, the judge writing the majority opinion here is sure, if we could, we know what they would say. They would say, don't give Elmer any money. And if somebody, if we could give, go back in a time machine to when they were passing the statute and said, what about somebody who murders his grandfather so he can inherit all the money right now? We're sure, 100%, they would have said, no way should that guy get any money. So that's what the court is saying here is that they are being, they're not just doing the right thing, they're pretty sure that the legislature would have wanted them to do this, in, 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 that they're being faithful to the legislative intent, even though the legislature didn't say that in the statute. The court also noted that there's a maxim, a common law maxim, that no one should profit from his own wrongdoing. This is an, like an old like legal tradition, so to speak. Now, we do have a dissenting opinion in this case. The dissent emphasized that the legislature determines the rules for disposition of property who wills, and that the statute had no qualifications. It was absolute. And so, therefore, we just have to do this. And that means that, yes, we're going to have an absolute law in a few cases around the edges that's going to produce uh, a, a bad result or something that's a little bit shocking. But overall, we need this strong rule most of the time to make estates predictable. Why? So that people before they die have some comfort in knowing that their will is going to be upheld and their wishes honored if they bother to do, you know, committing it to a will. The dissent also argued that allowing inheritance um, would not really contravene public policy. The public policy of the state of New York was found in the criminal statutes and the court was not at liberty to supplant them. They're basically saying, look, we've punished this guy. He's going to be in jail for a long time, maybe the rest of his life. And so the court, the, the dissent here is worried about judicial activism by the majority, saying that the majority is legislating from the bench, trying to address a problem, and the legislature actually already addressed the problem of people killing, uh, heirs killing the um person they're going to inherit money from, their parents or grandparents, in order to inherit, we charge those people with murder. We have a perfectly good law for dealing with this, according to the dissent. Now, here's a takeaway for my students for statutory interpretation. And that is this idea of an absurdity doctrine, which really has a long historical pedigree in the common law system. And uh, the qu one question about absurdity is, is this based on presumptions about legislative intent? That is how the court presents it in this case, and in a lot of the cases, not always. Sometimes they just say that we're going to do the right thing here, or that would we wouldn't be able to live with ourselves if we produced that result. But here the court go, like belabors the point that the absurdity doctrine is based on presumptions of the legislative intent and the court is here being a faithful agent of the legislature and not doing something that they know the legislature would want. 
But uh, one question for my students is, is it, is it possible that courts should just have limits for extremely unjust or shocking outcomes, right? Part of the purpose of the judiciary is to focus on justice and fairness, even more than the lawmakers, right? That we is that we always we think of lady justice holding up the scales and so forth. And so maybe there's something inherent in the the function of judges, like deep in a sort of deep philosophical sense, that judges are supposed to be concerned about just doing the right thing or having the result, the right outcome in that case, that judges um, should have some room for justice and, and, um, and righteousness and things like that. The concern, of course, and this is articulated by the dissent and by subsequent commentators, is maybe the absurdity doctrine is absurdity in the eye of the beholder. How often do courts get to do this? Can courts just say absurd every time they don't like something and invoke this? Could is, Does this open the door for judges to just whimsically do whatever they want and ignore what the statute says all the time? Because it, every, if you're really opinionated or stubborn, then any opinion other than your own may seem absurd. If you've spent any time on social media, you know that there's plenty of people who think that anyone who disagrees with them is obviously out of their mind. And so maybe the court, we're worried that there will be judges who will just dismiss any statute that they don't like as absurd. So we don't really have a bright line here with the absurdity doctrine about when courts get to apply it and when they don't. And that should make us a little bit uneasy. Okay, here's a review question to see if you've been paying attention. What was the statutory interpretation problem in Riggs v. Palmer? A, the statute contained a lot of ambiguous... Uh, let's continue. The argument most frequently made against giving general terms, the general means if they are one made and rejected in the slaughterhouse cases, that those who adopted the provision had in mind a particular narrow objective, equal protection for blacks. Two, they ex expressed a more general one, equal protection for any person. The conclusive, uh, conclusive uh, response to, uh, to this argument is that statutory prohibitions often go beyond the principal evil to cover reasonably comparable evils, and it's um, uh, ultimately the provisions of our laws rather than the principal concerns <coughs> of our legislators by which uh, we are governed. In the case from which uh, that statement derives on color against Sandovne offshore service, uh, the statute at issue made it an unlawful employment practice for an employer to discriminate against any individual because of such individual sex. Joseph Onkale worked as a Rostabot on a, an oil platform as part of an eight-man crew. He sued his employer under Title Seven, alleging that his male co-workers co had sexually harassed him. The lower, the lower courts rejected his claim, holding that the Title Seven did not cover claims by males alleging sex discrimination by other males. In the Supreme Court, however, on color prevailed. As the court had held before, the statue protects men as well as women. And just as there is no textual basis for limiting its protections to women, the court found no justification in the statutory language or its pre precedence for a categorical rule excluding same-sex harassment cl claims from the coverage of Title VII. The card uh, acknowledged that male on male sexual harassment in the workspace was absolutely not the principal evil Congress was concerned with when it enacted Title VII, but the statutory prohibition was probably forwarded. 
the other common argument against the application of the canon is slightly less ambiguous. If acknowledges that the general term uh, cannot be limited to the pre uh, precise evil that most concern that uh, lawgiver, but assets that when the situation at issue couldn't have been within the lawgiver's contemplation and ambiguity exists. That was the argument made in Pennsylvania Department of Corrections against Yeski. The plaintiff was a prisoner who, because uh, he suffered from hyperextension, has been included from participation in the person's motivational boot camp program, successful competition of which would have shorted his sentence. He contends that uh, this exclusion violated Title II of the Americans with Disabilities Act which provided that no qualified individual with a disability shall, shall, by reason of such disability, be excluded from participation in or be denied the benefits of the services, programs, or activities of a public entity. The Act de uh, denied public entity as any department, agency, special purpose, district, or other instrumentally of state or states or local government. The Department of Corrections argued that Congress couldn't possibly have had state prison programs in mind, that the question of whether the law applied to such programs had to no clear, um, not clear answer, and that the ambiguity should be resolved against federal interference with the running of state prisons. The Supreme Court of the United States disagreed. As you mean that Congress did not envision that the Americans with Disabilities Act would be applied to state prisoners in the context of an unambiguous statutory text that is irrelevant. As we have said before, the fact that a statute can be applied in situations not expressly anticipated by Congress does not demonstrate ambiguity. ambiguity. It demonstrates breadth. Sometimes the scope of the general term in uh, unclear in uh, case uh, people against Williamson decided by the Colorado Supreme Court in 1211. The defendant charged with sexual assault claimed that the victim consented to having sex with him in exchange for money and sought to introduce evidence that the victim had been arrested on five separate occasions for soliciting prostitution. The prosecution sought to, uh, to exclude that evidence by reason of Colorado's rape shield state, which created a presumption that evidence of a victim's prior or subsequent sexual conduct is irrelevant and was inadmissible. Williamson contended that solutions, solicitation of prostitution was not sexual conduct, but merely talk. The court held to the contrary. It is a close question whether the general term conduct includes the proposal of conduct, but the court's task was made easier by application of another canon that a charge in terminology suggests a change in meaning. While the legislator has used the term sexual conduct to describe the type of behavior that falls under the rape shield status, general rule of irrelevance and uh, inadmissibility, it has used more narrow and specific terms, such as sexual activity and sexual intercourse, when it carved uh, out exceptions to the, to the general rule and related status in the criminal. Criminal code relied on and defined more specific terms such as sexual instruction, in, instru instruction and sexual penetration. In the field of criminal law, the general term principle is subject to several well-established exceptions deriving from the common law requirement of evil intent for criminal liability. Seemingly absolute criminal prohibitions no person may will not be applied to government to government again uh, to government agents in the lawful execution of their duties to defendants who have been entrapped by the government and 
to those acting in self-defense um, without necessary. Another canon, omitted case uh, canon. Nothing is to be added uh, to what the text states of reasonably implies. That is, matter not covered is to treat it as not covered. Whatever template, templations that stay, statementship of policymaking might wisely suggest, construction must uh, echo into inter, uh, interpolation and um, evisceration. Uh, the judge must not treat in uh, uh, by way of creation, uh, said the Felix Frankfurter. Some reflections on the reading of status in nineteen forty seven. The principle that a matter not covered is not covered is so obvious that it seems absurd it rests it. The judge should not uh, presume that every state answers every question. The answers to be discovered through interpretation. As a noted law, lawyer, lawyer and statesman Elio Root said uh, that the judge is not his function or within his power to enlarge or improve or change the law. Now should the judge elaborate unprovided for exceptions to a text, a Justice Blackman noted while a circuit judge. If the Congress had intended to provide additional exceptions, it would have done in clear language. Yet some authorities assert the judicial power, even the judicial responsibility to supply words or even hold provisions that have been omitted. Some of them would have the card reconstruct what the enacting legislator would have wanted if it had addressed the overlooked case. As an asset, a judicial power entirely unconnected with a posited legislative intent. Statutory reform has been severely affected by the fiction that uh, when cards interpreter and apply status, there is not a creative role, but only the role of finding and applying the legislator's mandate. In what, uh, in what is perhaps its most extreme vision, this fiction takes the form of conclusion of presumption that when a legislator undertakes to prescribe at all for a problem, it prescribes in full. It is too plain for argument that Neither a court in lying down a decisional doctrine, nor a legislator in enacting a state can possibly foresee and provide answers for all the questions that will arise. Thus, it is a matter not of cho uh, choice, but of necessity that courts must act creatively when interpreting and applying status. The additional view and the one we support is to the contrary. The absent provision cannot be supplied by the cards. What the legislator would have wanted, it did not provide, and that is an end of the matter. As Justice Louis Brandeis put the point, a casus omissus does not justify judicial legislation. And Brandeis again, to supply omissions transcends the judicial function. A Maryland case, Montgomery County Volunteer Fire Rescue Association mm, against Montgomery County Board of Elections illustrate the point. Maryland's election law requires that a referendum petition contain the signer's address, his printed name, and the date of signing, and that the signer sign his name as it appears on the statewide voter registration list. The state provided the signature must be validated and counted if these requirements and other specified confirming requirements were met. In reviewing a petition to place a referendum on the ballot, the Montgomery County Board of Elections refused to validate many signatures because they are, were not legible, causing the petition to fail. Uh, in the uh, ensuing lawsuit, the board contended that it could not determine whether the signature represented the name as it appears on the statewide voter registration list, unless the signature was legible. 
the court decided that uh, illegibility in itself could not be a basis for invalidity. The court noted that the legislator could have added uh, legibility as a uh, prerequisite for validation, as several other states have done. But in the absence of such a penmanship uh, prerequisite, the board could not create one. The search for what the legislator would have wanted is invariably a, either a deception or delusion. What is a gap anyway? It is not a void of, of some kind that makes a court's decision logically impossible. Instead, it is the space between what the state provides and what the gap finding judge since it should have provided. It is nothing else than uh, the difference between the positive law and some other uh, order considered to be better, truer or juster. What has been uh, omitted uh, in the gap invariably turns out to be what the judge believes des desirable. So gap feeling uh, ultimately comes down to the assertion of an inherent judicial power to write the law. Our rejection of such a power does not rest on a belief that when a legislator undertakes to prescribe at all uh, for a problem in uh, prescribes in full. That is fair statement of the issue. The issue is whether when a legislator prescribes in a fashion that cuts regard uh, as uh, providing only in part and not in uh, full. What remains is to be governed by uh, pre exciting law and amended or rather by a new law enacted by the courts. Judicial amendment flatly, flatly contradicts democratic self-governance. Two caveats. First, interstitial lawmaking by courts is to be distinguished from the courts continuing exercise of uh, their uh, common law powers in uh, jurisdictions where those are retained. The fact, for example, that a state legislator changes one rule of judge-made tort law does not suggest that the court's power over the remainder of tort law has been eliminated. And the continued exercise of that power is not filling a gap in the state. When, however, the state will propose to provide a comprehensive treatment of the issue, it addresses judicial lawmaking um, is uh, implicitly excluded. Second, it is possibly possible uh, uh, so rare for a state to leave a matter or to future common law development by the courts, either expressly or where the state deals with the traditional field of common law jurisprudence by implication. An example of the latter is the Sherman Act, whose reference to restraint of trade has always been uh, taken to refer to activity so denominated that the common law made unlawful and to authorize continuing development of that common law by federal courts. Express commitment to common law development through that of the states rather than the federal courts is to be found in the Federal Tort Claims Act, which provides that the United States is liable <laughs> to tort claims. In the same manner, and uh, to the same extent as a private individual under like circumstances. The omitted case canon, the principle that what uh, text does not provide isn't provided, must sometimes be reconciled uh, with the principle that the text does include not only what is expressed, but also what is implicit. For example, when a text authorizes a certain act, it implicitly authorizes whatever it is a necessary predicate of the act. Authorization to harvest uh, uh, wheat generally implies authorization to enter the land for that purpose. In our earlier Montgomery County Board of Elections illustration, liability might well have been an implicit requirement of the statute if the statute had not required as it did, a printed name that could be compared with the voter registration list. To hold, on the other hand, uh, that a state were rendering certain action unlawful and uh, imposing governmental sanctions, 
implies a private right of action for violation of the statute uh, is gap feeling this used as implication. The same can be said of implications from uh, uh, penumbras, emanations, and other legal fictions. It is part of the skill and honestly of the good judge to disting uh, distinguish between filling gaps in the text and determine, determine what the text implies. Uh, thank you for an uh, attention. Uh, uh, I have uh, uh, some uh, question in the chat. Uh, uh, let's let's talk about it. Um, answering the question from the chat, uh, I will note uh, that uh, by and large, uh, um, you should not give preference to any of the so-called schools of interpretation. Uh, I believe uh, that each school. Uh, originated and developed uh, based on the legal system in which the state in which it appeared existed. Therefore, when analyzing different approaches, it is definitely worth using an integrated approach and using different tools developed by different schools. Uh, or about the second question, the meaning of law is to regulate uh, social relations, to streamline them, and it's the legal culture of the legislator. And the purity of uh, his intentions that determines how successful the law will be in these uh, directions. Uh, I so uh, sorry for my English. I thank you for your attention. Uh, Thank you, thank you very much, my dear colleagues. Okay, thank you so much for Mr. Pavlo for the wonderful information. Before I close this event, uh, we will go to, to the time for picture for documentation. For all participants, please open your camera. I will take a picture on the cone of three. One, two, three. Okay, another one. One, two, three. Smile. Thank you. Thank you for your clean cooperation. Finally, we come to the end of visiting lecture today. We would like to thank you for Mr. Pavlo for the wonderful information and sharing your knowledge. We hope this information will be beneficial for all participants. At least we hope to have more collaboration in the future with University Custom and Finance Ukraine. The visiting lecture for today and here. We hope to see you soon. Thank you and have a nice day. Thank you so much for all participants. Goodbye. Bye.